Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. And I'm here with Joe. Joe, welcome to the Investors Podcast and Bitcoin Fundamentals. Thanks for having me, Preston. Hey, so you had recently uh, posted a thread that I thought was phenomenal, really interesting uh, point of view, and you had some charts with it. And it all relates to the Lightning Network, and it relates to what I would think you're describing here as a risk-free rate. So instead of describing it as, as whatever, I'm going to pass it over to you. That I think the title of your thread was called Time Value of Lightning. And walk us through what you think is going on here. For sure. Absolutely. So to take a step back, um, all the way back to 2018, when Nick Batia originally published The Time Value of Bitcoin, uh, within there, he originally talked about how in order for you know sort of this Bitcoin capital market to emerge, uh, the time value of Bitcoin, right? So you know the, uh, a rate of return earned on Bitcoin uh, would need to be published, right? And so at that point in time, obviously there was you know the, the Lightning Network hadn't even uh, you know it, it didn't have a tremendous amount of capacity, but uh, it was positive that the Lightning Network would be uh, sort of the way that this could be made possible. Fast forward four years now, and we have a couple of examples of that. Um, you know, in terms of there being a risk-free rate, basically the the reason I I posited this in the thread was because it's it's underwritten that this concept of a lightning network reference rate, right? Being able to park your capital on the lightning network and earn yield, right, with no implicit default risk whatsoever. Um, you know, th this sort of this concept I came to is because arguably Bitcoin and Lightning have the lowest counterparty risk profile of just about any capital market in existence, right? Um, because they're underwritten by an asset that when custodied, it doesn't have any counterparty risk. And so for that reason, uh, you know, I went ahead and uh, developed this article and then I turned it into a thread that essentially goes through all of the different innovations that have happened uh, across Bitcoin, but also across uh, lightning and the lightning landscape that have sort of inched us closer to a capital market that's, that's underwritten by the rails uh, of Bitcoin and lightning. So for a person who is potentially not intimately familiar with Lightning and you you use this terminology, no implicit default risk, walk us through opening a channel and then why there's no implicit default risk for a person that would open a channel and participate in the rules in a uh, ethical way. Right. So there are a couple. There are a couple of risks uh, when it comes to operating a Lightning channel. Um, one of the first ones is is hot wallet risk, right? So the risk that you know a bad actor, uh, if a channel does have a whole lot of uh, Bitcoin within it, then a bad actor could potentially hack into uh, one of the participants in that channel and then drain funds. So there is a little bit more risk associated with a Lightning channel than something like cold storage Bitcoin. Essentially, to back it up even further. On the Lightning Network, essentially, it's a way of making Bitcoin uh, more scalable because the main blockchain for Bitcoin doesn't have a lot of transactional capacity. Um, you know, seven transactions per second compared to Visa's forty thousand or something to that tune. Uh, Bitcoin essentially wouldn't function as something like a medium of exchange without a scaling solution in order to make it more viable. And that's where the Lightning Network steps in. Essentially, you can open up a channel. Um, between participants. And essentially, in the simplest terms, you can sort of hold Bitcoin in escrow between two participants and then uh, basically add and subtract uh, from a ledger just between you two, uh, who owes who what, right? So for example, going into a coffee shop and ordering a coffee, um, you know, the channel between myself and the coffee shop owner uh, basically balances just get updated within our personal ledger, as opposed to having to record that transaction on the main Bitcoin blockchain. And we can transact between each other infinitely uh, until we decide to finally settle up and then uh, close off our channel on the main chain. Um, and the beautiful thing about uh, the Lightning Network is that uh, participants can use uh, channels that have connections uh, that aren't directly to them. So instead of every single new person who goes into this coffee shop having to open up a channel with the coffee shop owner, uh, you know, let's say I have a channel that's opened up with my friend 
who's opened up a channel with the coffee shop, my payment gets routed through his channel into the coffee shop. And so uh, essentially what you've got is this web of uh, you know interacting channels with one another that liquidity gets routed through. Uh, the beautiful thing about it too is your payment is going to go through the channel that is uh, routed most efficiently, i.e. has the lowest fees. Uh, and so it really... Uh, attacks one of those pain points of Bitcoin, which was it's extremely expensive to move funds on chain uh, when there's a lot of demand for transactional capacity. And Lightning Network really, uh, you know, came onto the scene and provided a solution for that. So there are there are various risks with having a channel. Um, there's hot wallet risk. There's inactive peer risk, which let's say the coffee shop owner, uh, you know, goes offline. And you know we can't settle up on the blockchain. Uh, there's forced closure risk, where you know whether it be an inactive partner or some other reason, our channel gets forcibly closed. There are a lot of risks in operating a Lightning channel, um, but for various reasons, not unlike uh, goldsmiths being the individuals who held you know everybody's gold in reserve, and then uh, you know they they managed the ownership between participants. I believe, and, and Nick and I believe that something like lightning banks will emerge where uh, these sort of entities who can allocate capital most efficiently, who can manage these channels, who have the technical wherewithal to manage these channels, uh, they will be the ones who end up routing liquidity, managing these channels uh, over time as you know transactional capacity increases for, for the lightning network. Just a, uh, an important highlight there. You were talking about the forced closures between channels on the lightning network. What I think people need to understand is when we say there's risk there, let's say you and I open a channel together and you drop off the network and I just I can't communicate with your node anymore and we have an open channel, I can force close that channel. And if you continue to to be gone and off the network, after a certain number of blocks, it's going to close that out. We're going to to adjudicate the on-chain fees in order to to write that into the layer one Bitcoin. And you're going to get your your sats and I'm going to get my sats in that situation, even though you left the network and it turned into a forced closure. So it's not that the funds were at risk because the other network participant uh, disappeared. Um, we can still close it out. It's the time that I think would probably be quantified as the risk of funds being locked as you're going through that forced closure situation. And so... I just want to highlight this because people that aren't intimately familiar running their own node, having open lightning channels and things like that, they hear things uh, on the surface and they're saying, oh my God, it just sounds risky. I don't, I don't understand any of that. And the real risk I would say is just the lack of understanding and the execution of doing something like this. But your funds are very secure. I mean, the, the, the node that I've run, like I've never run into an issue where, or a concern of like, I'm not going to get my funds back that I opened the channel on. It's I don't know if you would have a different way to to quantify that. And I'm not trying to undersell risk here, but it's way different than putting it on a centralized uh, exchange and lending out coins. It's like not even in the same universe as far as risk goes. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, exactly as you mentioned, the, the risk here is more so that your funds are, are inaccessible for a brief amount of time. Um, and, and the fact that this is, you know, a, a risk that isn't even having anything to do with lost funds, uh, it just goes to show like we're we're reaching the try and find risks that are on the Lightning Network. Yeah, Whereas yeah. in traditional capital markets, right, let's say you move your way up the risk curve uh, to something like venture capital or equities, there's far more associated risk with that. Um, there's far more associated risk with, you know, other cryptocurrencies. Um, on the Lightning Network, you know, I, I sort of make this argument um, that because uh, you know there there are so few risks as we mentioned and and a lot of these risks actually don't involve you know permanent deletion or inaccessibility to funds uh, you know then uh, it it is more considered uh, considered more risk free um, than you know the moniker that we give to base layer money like United States Treasuries which do incur you know explicit and implicit default risk. I mean, we, we've never defaulted on our debt in a, in a major way, as, as far as I'm aware, uh, but we can, right? That is a, an explicit risk, the implicit risk of holding uh, a negative yielding bond, right? There are, there are various associated risks with traditional finance instruments that just aren't present, uh, I feel, to the same degree you know, on, uh, on Bitcoin and Lightning. Hey, I just popped up this picture of this risk curve that you um, 
we're sort of talking about. Let me pull it back up here and then just kind of describe to the people that are listening what we're looking at and uh, what this really represents as, as far as you're concerned. Of course. So the, the way that we can quantify a capital market uh, is by plotting the different financial instruments in, in said capital market uh, based on their risk profile. And we do that um, for the people who are listening on audio, we have uh, a return on the y-axis and risk on the x-axis. And essentially, uh, as you plot these instruments against one another, um, you have lower risk profiles at the bottom of the curve, all the way up to very, very high associated risk at the top end of the curve. And this is a, a pretty uh, easy way of visualizing risk in any capital market that you're dealing with. And so up here on the screen, physical gold is at the very bottom of the traditional finance risk curve, specifically because not unlike Bitcoin, when you're custodying it on your own, uh, there's no default risk, there's no counterparty risk, uh, no custodial risk, right? If you hold it physically and you're defending it uh, and it's done securely by the owner. Obviously, the trade-off here is that you have to have uh, the security in place, you have to have the technical wherewithal to defend it. Um, so that comes with the trade-off, right? Not only is it non-yielding, but it requires you know a lot of additional work to, to secure it well. And that's why uh, a little bit up the risk curve is US Treasuries. Now, for, for people watching on video, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not saying US Treasuries are, are much further up the risk curve than physical gold. Obviously, we, you know, it, it's been said many a time that, you know, they're as good as gold. But as I mentioned, there's explicit and implicit risk uh, withholding US Treasuries. Uh, moving up the curve yet still uh, are corporate bonds. Obviously, they have higher default risk. And so they trade at a spread to US Treasuries. And so every single rung up this risk curve, uh, it demands a higher rate of return because of the uh, increased associated risk with it. Um, and so this is sort of the easiest way for market participants who are you know, hunting for collateral to take a look at all the instruments available to them. And based on their risk tolerance, uh, whether they're, they're a corporation or a sovereign or an individual, to take a look at this risk curve and then determine where they want to allocate their capital. This is the um, traditional finance risk curve in a nutshell, basically. You know what's interesting is I'm looking at this chart, and, you, and what's really noticeable about the shape of it is kind of the uh, it's not linear. It has this this bow in it as as you're uh, going higher up into the uh, riskier categories. And I would argue that as you get into a currency uh, debacle or a situation that we're currently experiencing on a global level, that this this probably shifts to being more linear than the shape that, that you're kind of seeing on this chart where like the US treasuries are still having the 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 risk is going up as the return is being diminished and you're not getting this this shape that you have displayed here. But uh I'm I'm not criticizing the chart. I just find it maybe as an interesting observation as to the current macro uh, setting that we've been experiencing here in the last few years, that maybe the shape of some of this stuff is getting you know, all out of whack from what we would typically see. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you take a look at emerging markets, they have uh, record levels of distressed debt. Um, as of right now, actually over the last week or two, um, corporate credit spreads have been coming down, investment grade and high yield. So you know, some credit stress is being alleviated, but you're absolutely right. Like in, in situations where maybe, you know, your your country you know, doesn't have dollar denomination in its capital market and you're really distressed fiat currency. I mean, look at basically all of Southern Europe right now. Uh, you know, they're, they're about to enter crisis mode and and they hiked, you know, 50 basis points for the, it, will, it was their first hike in, in over 10 years, right? So for for more distressed nations, more distressed currencies, you're absolutely right. I, I would say it's more linear. Hey, so let's, uh, let's talk more on the specifics of the Lightning Network and this yield curve. I'm going to put up a chart right now that I find really interesting, and I'm kind of curious as to why you're seeing this bump <laughs> that's being displayed here. So this is the Lightning Liquidity Weekly Average Annual Percentage Rate um, from May till August. You see it looks like it's trying to hover around 2%, but you have this jump in June that it surged up to 8%. I'm, I'm curious what caused that, and then just more generally speaking, some of your thoughts on just interest that's being received here. 
Of course, yeah. So as for the spike in June, uh, and for, for people who are listening, what we have up on the screen right now is this is from Amboss Technologies. They recently launched earlier this year uh, something called Magma, which is actually a lightning channel marketplace where market participants can go and they can lease uh, liquidity. Uh, and essentially, this is uh, one of the first major examples of a widely reported interest rate. Um, and we'll talk about uh, why that's important in just a second. Uh, as for the as for the bump in June, uh, it, it's in all likelihood, um, you know, due to increased demand for channel liquidity. And the the reason it, you know, it forexes all the way up past 8% there is because as of right now on Magma, I'm looking here, there's only one, there's only 31 uh, Bitcoin deployed as of right now, uh, 667 channels opened. So, you know, it has a very, very small liquidity profile. And so, you know, uh, demand shocks in, in you know my estimation are probably what spiked that significantly up. I think you know over time we talk about transactional capacity. Over time, as there's more transactional capacity for things like Lightning, as uh, you know the Lightning network sort of emerges uh, as this layer that people want to earn a return on, and its liquidity profile increases in tandem with that, um, then you know ultimately like this APR and other interest rates that are derived from the Lightning network will smooth out. Um, but you know, this, this technology is all in its infancy. Most of what I wrote about is conceptual. Uh, so it's, you know, if for, to me, it's just pretty remarkable to see all this stuff widely reported. I have not played around with magma. So, uh, how would a person go about pulling this up? How would just walk us through the steps if somebody at home wanted to try it out? For sure. Yeah. So you can go to amboss.space slash magma, and mm -hmm. basically you can log in with your node. Uh, they have a process for doing that. And you, you can also, uh, you don't need a node in order to peruse all of the different uh, information on there. So on the homepage, you could see the total amount of sats earned uh, in interest as of right now, uh, it's 8 million sats. So again, you know, relatively infantile network, only 10% of a Bitcoin uh, has been earned in interest as of right now. But you could also scroll down. And again, this is a liquidity marketplace. So like you can take a look at Every single channel that's up for lease, uh, you know the the minimum and maximum APR, uh, you know the history of the market participant. It's all transparent, so you can choose these nodes based on the time that you want to lock up or the time that you want to lease the liquidity for. Uh, you know the reputation of the individual. Not unlike you know a, a traditional fixed income market, uh, which is really remarkable. I mean, this is sort of the first instance in Bitcoin. Uh, one of the first instances. I know that Lightning Labs had something similar. Uh, with pool. But this is one of the first major instances of participants being able to peruse and, and lease liquidity uh, over Lightning. Um, again, not unlike a, uh, a traditional fixed income market. Another graphic I sent was the uh, Bitcoin Lightning risk curve. And it's it's basically the same thing as the traditional finance risk curve, the same concept. Um, but I've gone ahead and replaced each point on the risk curve with uh, these different uh, Bitcoin capital market instruments. So, you know, cold storage Bitcoin obviously doesn't have any yield, doesn't have any counterparty risk because you're custodying it on your own. And then, you know, this Lightning Network liquidity lease, um, you know, is is another rung up the risk curve uh, and it's trading at a basis point spread, not to get too technical, um, just like traditional fixed income markets. Um, and then, you know, again, numerous other instruments um, that are available on uh, the Lightning Network, and this is conceptual. Again, um, you know what what we've seen in implementation is Magma and a couple of other Amboss uh, and a couple of other liquidity marketplaces. Excuse me, um, but if anything, what it demonstrates is that there's a structural demand for secondary markets of liquidity. There is demand uh, for the use of Bitcoin uh, as a place where people can buy and sell uh, collateral as ne as they need to. So uh, I'm I'm a little familiar with Pool. Is there much difference between magma and pool? And if there is, what are the, what are some of the differences? So I I'm not the best person to comment on that. For this piece in particular, I dove especially deep into magma mm -hmm. because they have a pretty fantastic UI. Um, you know, very very friendly user interface. Pool I think is a little bit more complex. I'm pretty sure it's it's closed off to node operators. Like you know, for for magma, I mentioned to the listeners, you could hop right on and take a look at all the available channels for sale. Whereas with something like Pool, um, I'm not sure that somebody who is a node operator could do that. Oh, okay. And can somebody who's running an Umbral node uh, 
just log into that amboss.space slash magma and set this up like easy peasy. Yeah, absolutely. You can. I, need, I need to try this out. I'm real I'm very curious. Yeah, it's um, it's cool. I mean, if you're if you're an efficient capital manager, if you're efficient at channel management, you could earn a rate of return on top of your existing uh routing. It's pretty cool. It sounds awesome. I'm gonna definitely check it out. Okay, so for the last like 260 days, we've been in a bear market, a pretty aggressive bear market. Um, for people in traditional markets, they would des- describe it as a death spiral, <laughs> a bear market. What are some of your thoughts on the leverage and really kind of Ponzi-like situation that that's unfolded with Luna and 3AC and all these others? What are some of your thoughts? Most definitely. I mean, I think the best way to describe it is uh, a chain of dominoes, right? So with Luna, again, it, it like... In the, in the truest sense, Terra Luna mirrored a Ponzi scheme almost one to one. You know, they, they would burn and create new uh, new tokens uh, uh, amongst both of them as new participants entered and exited. Uh, you know, and then when there was a huge dash for the exits, there wasn't enough liquidity to go around, and you know, the token went to zero, both of them. Uh, and so that was sort of the, the 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 finger that knocked over this chain of dominoes of extremely fragile. Market participants in, the, in terms of their in terms of their balance sheet fragility, uh, namely three hours capital, right? Three hours capital, uh, obviously fifty fifty eight billion dollar fund. Um, you know, for those listening, for those curious, that's the same size as Bernie Madoff's fund, right? So uh, it, it's it's absolutely major. A lot of people are calling this, you know, the Lehman moment for for cryptocurrency more broadly, and I tend to agree, right? Um, you had major players, FTX, uh, Deribit, Bitmax. BlockFi, Genesis, Voyager, Voyager went bankrupt, right? They declared, I think it was chapter 11, bankruptcy protection. And so, you know, you had all these different market participants that were very uh, highly intertwined uh, with Three Arrows Capital. Um, And uh, they were lending, a lot of them were lending to Three Arrows Capital under collateralized or with no collateral at all based on reputation alone. For example, Voyager, uh, they lent Three Arrows $665 million dollars completely uncollateralized, completely uncollateralized. And so, you know, when uh, word got out that Three Arrows was having solvency issues, uh, you know, places like BlockFi, they they had a $1 billion collateralized loan, 80% margin requirement, they were able to liquidate it, they were fine. But because, uh, you know, places like Voyager, they essentially lent to 3AC based on reputation alone, and they got smoked because of it. You know, client funds out the door. Who's to say um, how much of it will be recovered? Um, players like Celsius also very heavily intertwined with this. Celsius was more so taking customer funds and putting them into these yield protocols. We just you know spent twenty minutes talking about a real way to earn yield. But for the listeners and viewers, uh, the 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 way that Celsius was you know parking their funds in these different protocols, uh, they were earning essentially yield. From nowhere, yield from nothing, yield from printing these worthless tokens, um, and essentially, over two months, Bitcoin, right, as a result of all this, experienced five billion dollars in sell pressure, five billion dollars, uh, and it was still able to find a cohort uh, of buyers around the twenty thousand dollar area. So it's absolutely remarkable. I'm of the belief that we've seen the worst of it, but who knows? I mean, you know, Lehman occurred after you know the majority of it, uh, the majority of the turmoil had already gone by. Uh, as far as I know, I was I was seven years old at the time, but who knows? There could still be some uh, could still be some skeletons in the closet for Bitcoin. Hey, so I've got the chart that you just said these numbers, and I mean it's this is a massive number: two hundred thirty six thousand Bitcoin liquidated by large known entities um, since May twelfth alone, and. Um, yeah, Luna was massive, eighty thousand Bitcoin out of that Ponzi scheme. Uh, the other one that you didn't mention by name here was Tesla, twenty nine thousand Bitcoin sold into the market. I'm kind of curious on 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 your thoughts on Tesla in in general. So, you know, when Tesla made this announcement that they were going to buy Bitcoin, and I'm just looking at the stability of their free cash flows. And it's gotten better since they've made that announcement as far as like their ability to to demonstrate like some semblance of bringing cash through the door. But up until that point, like they weren't 
they were not stacking free cash flows. They didn't have free cash flows. So much of whatever was coming through the door was subs- subsidies from the government. It wasn't like good organic like free cash flows. And so for me, the the announcement that they were putting on the balance sheet just and I even told uh, Anthony Pompliano and I were talking about it when they made the announcement. I was like, this caught me totally off guard. I would This would have been one of the last companies that I would expect it. He said he had the opposite opinion. What are your thoughts? Like, this seems inevitable to me that they would be a seller at this point. Like, you've got to, you've got to have free positive cash flows in order to stack bitcoins. Michael Saylor is a great example of that point. Yeah. No. I mean, Tesla, sort of a company living off of subsidies, uh, to to put it bluntly. And we we actually did a report on this over at the Bitcoin layer, Nick and I, uh, we talked about essentially this was just window dressing, right? From from Tesla, yeah. we titled it Tesla's new drapes, um, you know, uh, on their Q2 earnings call, said they sold 75% of their Bitcoin. So they still have some Bitcoin, but mm-hmm. you're, you're exactly right. Um, you know, in, in my purview, it's just an accounting gimmick, right? You know, by selling, uh, you know, the, the 29,000 Bitcoin, they were able to add 936 million bucks, uh, to their balance sheet, right? Um, their cash balance actually would have shrunk by $117 million. Um, and it would have been their, uh, it would have been their first quarter of the year, uh, where they had, um, uh, a negative cash balance. And so, uh, you know, in, in my purview, that's just, it's just window dressing. Um, you know, Tesla is still the, uh, the second largest corporation, in terms of the Bitcoin treasury, um, but I mean, in, in times like these, it's important to, uh, to to remember, right? Cash flow is king. I mean, Michael Saylor is doing it right with MicroStrategy. They have a solid software business. They can rely, uh, you know, on those free cash flows. Tesla, not so much, right? It was pretty bold of them to add uh, a Bitcoin strategy when, as you said, you know, they're really struggling with cash flows even now, and they rely heavily on you know good regulatory environment from the United States government to stay afloat. Yeah, I. It just amazes me online. You just see so many comments from people that just don't understand the basics of companies producing free cash. I, I don't know if it's the market uh, environment that everyone's just used to. Oh, just do another fundraising round or just sell more shares, and it's it's like it, earnings just don't matter. Um, but I, maybe that's the hardcore value investor uh, background in me coming out, but. What? No, you're right. I mean, we've what? we've had more zombie companies than ever. I mean, money has yeah. been essentially free. People have been able to borrow at you know a, a small spread to the T bill for since 2008. Basically, free money. Yeah, um, you know, you, you've seen the impact of that now that the the effective price of money, right? I mean, the policy rate right now is what two two fifty. Um, people can't survive when they're borrowing at a spread to to that. Um, it's uh, it's quite remarkable. It is. I'm going to throw up another chart here, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier with the risk curve versus the return, and you have it adapted for lightning. Walk us through what you're showing here, and it looks like you're, uh, I'll let you, yeah, you describe what what you think here on this. For sure, yeah. So there's one aspect of the risk curve that I'll, I'll describe when we get there, but I mentioned Bitcoin's capital market. Uh, and its risk profile um, can sort of be uh, illustrated best with a risk curve. So we talked about the traditional finance risk curve. You know, you've got gold at the bottom, uh, the least risky, least, uh, you know, no counterparty risk. If you're holding it on your own, no custodial risk, uh, you know, unless it gets demonetized uh, and then venture capital all the way at the top being the riskiest. And, And what I've gone ahead and done, and again, this piece was very conceptual. This is sort of a future conceptual Bitcoin lightning risk curve. The reason I wanted to do this was so people who are, you know, very adept when it comes to building instruments like these, they can take a look at this and and, and become inspired. I took a lot of uh, took a lot of inspiration from Nick's original piece way back in 2018 to sort of adapt uh, what he did there and bring it into the present and sort of give people an update on the way that these these protocols were evolving in tandem. But at the bottom of the risk curve is is cold storage Bitcoin, right? Obviously, you know, it's uh, it's non yielding, obviously, but it's non-custodial, counterparty free, uh, you know, and unlike the United States government, obviously we've never defaulted on our debt, but physical uh, cold storage Bitcoin could be considered, uh, you know, completely 
devoid of all counterparty risk, uh, all default risk, all custodial risk. So it sort of mirrors physical gold and its risk profile. And you know, if you play these two risk curves back to back, you could sort of see how these instruments align with one another um, in terms of having similar risk profiles. And then a step above that is the Lightning Network reference rate. Uh, this was originally coined by Nick uh, back in 2018 in order to describe basically a standardized rate of return that people could earn uh, through parking their capital on a Lightning channel. Uh, this is at a spread to cold storage Bitcoin because obviously it incurs uh, all of the, the Lightning risks inherent to the, the protocol that we talked about earlier. Um, the utility of publishing uh, a Lightning Network reference rate um, is, is just to show market participants, right, that Bitcoin can be, uh, you know, a fully fledged capital market in and of itself. The idea of having uh, a widely reported return on your investment, uh, you know, the idea there is that it attracts liquidity to the ecosystem. Um, so that's a step above cold storage. Bitcoin obviously requires a little bit more work to manage. Uh, then the Lightning liquidity lease uh, the, this is to illustrate marketplaces like Magma, these liquidity lease marketplaces where, you know, not unlike a bank issuing a loan, uh, somebody can put up their uh, channel liquidity for uh, for lease. Uh, and, you know, people can people can come purchase it for specified periods of time. And underneath it, you'll notice I put LNRR plus fifty bips. Right now, you know, this is not this is not alien talk. Uh, this is mostly just to illustrate. How this sort of emulates a uh, traditional fixed income instrument. So um, LNRR is the Lightning Network reference rate. And something that's a little bit more risky, something that incurs uh, things like, you know, uh, the risk of the marketplace going down uh, and other associated risks, uh, it, it trades at a basis point spread to Lightning Network reference rates, right? So it's a little bit more expensive than the, the proverbial risk-free rate of the Lightning Network. And then one step above that, um, I've put Taro Asset Lending. Um, and we could talk about this, but Taro by Lightning Labs is essentially uh, a protocol that's in development by them that would allow for asset issuance, any asset um, on Bitcoin and Lightning, right? So essentially, the reason this trades at a spread to LN liquidity lease is because obviously that incurs all of the associated risk with anybody who issues an asset on their own. Um, and then at the very top, off-chain lending, that incurs the most risk. And so it's the most expensive. Um, but you also have a pretty high potential for return. Obviously, you know, when you're off-chain, you incur uh, default risk, you incur counterparty risk. Um, counterparty risk at a level that isn't present with all the other four risks on the curve. And really, this is just a way of illustrating uh, every single instrument on uh, Bitcoin's future potential capital market based on the way I see things are going. Yeah, on the tarot asset. So this is something that uh, I can't, I think maybe I've talked about it once or twice on the show with guests. This is very similar to uh, what Adam Back did with the liquid network, but it's on top of lightning. And I think that's the the key difference between what Adam did with liquid and what Taro at lightning labs is trying to do here. But don't you think that, uh, from a risk standpoint, cause that's what we're talking about. So much of it comes down to what that digital asset is representing. So if, if it's representing a token in a video game, that's one thing. But if it's representing something physical in the real world or an NFT or, or whatever, it really depends on what that digital token is representing. So the, as far as the 150 bips that you have listed there next to that, plus your lightning reference rate, um, I'm assuming that's, that's a very flexible uh, <laughs> spread be, depending on what type of digital asset you're talking about. Absolutely. You know, that's that's definitely variable because, you know, somebody could be issuing stable coins or somebody could be issuing uh, a photo of a monkey. Right. Um, so, it, you know, similar to the fixed income space, it all it all depends on the credit credit worthiness of the issuer. Um, you know, it all depends on the, the reputation of the issuer uh, that 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 spread uh, is absolutely variable. But it, it's interesting. I mean, Taro uh, is uh, you can issue assets on the, the Bitcoin main chain, but it can be it can be sent over lightning, which is the real innovation in my purview. Mm, but mm. ultimately, like what is what's made possible through this um, is you know, any asset you can think of 
primarily in my mind, what that immediately jumps to is like all the world's currencies, right? You know, we've got dozens, hundreds of fiat currencies all circulating. Um, and those currencies can be traded between market participants um, and, you know, the, for goods and services between participants uh, and in and amongst one another, right? So sort of inter and intra currency all over Bitcoin denominated financial rails, right? So it's sort of, it's using these uh, Satoshis, these 100 millionth uh, units of a Bitcoin uh, as the vehicle for sending these currencies back and forth. And so, you know, even if people aren't a fan of, uh, you know, monkey JPEGs trading on, on you know, using the Bitcoin uh, and Lightning Networks uh, as transmittal rails, uh, I think what people should be looking at is that any increase in demand for transactional capacity will also come with increased network liquidity on Bitcoin in order to facilitate those transactions. And so to me, you know, for for participants who live maybe in El Salvador or other countries that are thinking about adopting this technology, a major onboarding milestone would be the ability to hold Bitcoin and dollars in the same wallet, right? Right now, that's sort of reliant on uh, a third party, right? Right, Like Strike, they create a user interface um, and they're not in the same wallet, but they're in the same application. Uh, and Taro sort of jumps directly over that uh, and, and sort of allows for all these different currencies uh, to be held within one Bitcoin wallet. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. That's crazy. So if you wanted to hold now, obviously, uh, Tether, USDC, all of these, these tokens that are being issued um, by those entities have the risk of those entities actually owning dollars or whatever they're using as the peg uh, in some type of account to represent that token that's issued. But you're saying the token itself, even though it's USDC or Tether, can now uh, be held physically, physically, uh, physically held in your Bitcoin wallet over the Terra network. Did I describe that correctly? Yeah, no, you're you're basically entirely on point. And the the fantastic thing about this is that the only thing that the 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 channels on the Lightning Network need to know is that they're routing liquidity, and that's already what they do. They don't need to know what asset they're routing. All they mm. know is they're routing Bitcoin, right? So if I wanted to send USDC to you, uh, you know, through the channels, the first hop into the Lightning Network per se, it gets converted. My my Bitcoin or my uh, USDC gets converted to Bitcoin gets sent through the Lightning Network in the most optimal way. And then on the last hop to you, gets converted right back into USDC, which sounds a lot like Strike's business model, right? Strike, yeah. I know the idea that you could send dollars, somebody receives Bitcoin and vice versa. But this essentially takes that business model and and embeds it, uh, you know, creates a method for embedding it into Bitcoin and Lightning itself. It's pretty cool. How the hell is that possible? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> How the heck is anybody smart enough to piece that together is the question it's like unreal nuts it's crazy uh okay you have said to me rates lead the dance yes what what do you mean by this of course yeah so uh if you want to pull up the chart what i've done here is i've mapped the United States two uh, United States two year Treasury yield uh, against the federal funds rate upper bound. So, Fed funds is obviously the policy rate that gets set by the central bank, uh, the Federal Reserve. And as you can see here, uh, every single time that the two year yield falls below the federal funds rate, uh, the Fed pauses their hike cycle, right? And then ultimately, when it becomes a precipitous fall below the federal funds rate, um, then they're forced to pivot their hiking cycle in the other direction. Um, you know, this is a historical precedent. Uh, for those wondering, uh, the reason the two-year yield was chosen is because the two-year yield trades with uh, forward policy rate expectations. Um, so the two-year yield can sort of be thought of uh, as where the market believes uh, the, the policy rate is going to be. Uh, and so that's essentially one of the charts um, you know, that you can use to gauge whether or not a, a pause or a pivot uh, you know, would be coming. Um, and as of right now, uh, the two year, it bounced this week, um, you know, but it's channeling sideways uh, in that range as of right now. And at the Bitcoin layer, we're not, we're not saying a pivot is coming. We're just reading the charts. Uh, you know, we try to play things probabilistically as opposed to, you know, 
being extremely granular and trying to make, you know, all these minute predictions. Um, but looking at this and then taking a look at uh, Fed funds futures, um, which is something that is derived with overnight index swap data, uh, which also shows that uh, a policy rate pivot uh, or at least pause is coming early Q1 next year. Um, you know, for those reasons, we sort of presuppose that uh, September could be, uh, you know, the last hike we see before a pause, not the terminal rate by any means, um, you know, unless something extreme were to blow up, credit spreads blew out, uh, you know, and then the Fed was forced to jump in. We don't view that as likely. We don't view like, we don't view as if that's coming soon. Um, but taking a look at the two year versus Fed funds, and then also uh, this uh, overnight index swap uh, policy rate expectation, um, you know, we're taking a look that the, the Fed is, you know, they're, they're walking a pretty tight rope here. I love this chart and uh, you're exactly right. I mean, look at, look at when those two intersect and every time they've paused, at least since 2000 uh, on this chart that we're displaying. And I'm sure if you went back uh, another 10 or 20 years, you would see that this continues to hold true to uh, where they're at. And, and thanks for the futures chart here and showing everybody where, you know, a lot of people will throw out comments. Yeah, I think they're going to pause at the beginning of the year, but they don't understand the analysis or like the the data that's supporting that opinion. And um, that's exactly what you're showing us right here. So, absolutely. What do you, what do you think is going to happen in the fall? I mean, it it really feels like things are going to start getting spicy here in the fall. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, if if rates continue their their precipitous fall, you know, and they fall below Fed funds, then we could see a pause uh, sooner than we think. the The upper bound of the terminal rate that we're at right now is, you know, if we actually go beyond this, if in September, which that by all accounts they are going to, Jerome Powell is going to speak late August about, you know, probably give some forward guidance about what they're actually going to do, uh, but. You know when they hike another 50 basis points or 75, um, and and we'll get a better understanding of what consensus is as we move forward. Then that will be the first time since uh, I'm pretty sure the the very early 80s uh, when you know Volcker hiked to, to 17, 18 uh, percent that the policy rate will be high. That the terminal rate for this hike cycle will be higher than the terminal rate for the last hike cycle, uh, which would be pretty remarkable, especially considering. Uh, uh, debt to GDP has has what doubled, uh, tripled in the time frame since the last hike cycle. It's insane. Uh, you know, the Fed, uh, in order to bring down this inflation, which obviously is their mandate, right? Because they're also facing a pretty big credibility problem. Um, you know, Jerome Powell is is uh, as Jeff Snyder says, he's he's channeling his Paul Volcker. He's trying to do his best impression of of somebody who who's willing to fight inflation at all costs. Uh, and you know, they stand the risk of of bankrupting. Uh, all these fragile sovereign nations that hold this dollar denominated debt. It's it's a crazy situation. You know, I think in the fall, uh, Southern European nations, other emerging markets, we see, you know, uh, defaults ensue over there uh, among the more fragile ones in, in terms of their uh, their their credit risk. Uh, it's 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 not a it's not a pretty look for the fall, in my opinion. Yeah. What do you think about? And I know this is really short term. I like like you, I like to talk about the longer uh, moves, but what do you think of this bounce that we're seeing right now? So uh, for people listening, a lot of people from the future listening, uh, it's it's 3 August. We've had quite a bounce in equities. You know, I'll I'll tell you my opinion after uh, you respond because I don't want to, you know, go ahead. What, what, what are your thoughts on this bounce? For sure. Yeah. So, so there's two schools of thought. Um, you know, there's there's a school of thought that this is this is a bear market rally, um, you know, spurred on by the fact that, oh, my gosh, you know, in, in a month we, we saw 15 percent, 20 percent losses to the Nasdaq, to the S&P, um, you know, and, and 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 people are buying euphorically thinking that oh, a pivot or a pause is coming. Um, and there's there's a school of thought. Th there are a couple of different schools of thought. So I'll stop saying schools of thought. Um, but there's there's also the idea that, OK, um, Two years are trending down. Ten year fell pretty precipitously. At you know, at, at its highest wick, it was three five, um, and and now it it actually wicked down to two five. And so the you know risk is is forward looking. And so there's an idea that okay, because risk is forward looking, they're seeing all these key rates begin falling. Okay, now it's time to you know now it's time to rally once again. Uh, potentially balance sheet conditions moving into the next year are going to be more optimal because you know. 
maybe by some miracle, these companies were able to you know, r- roll their debt in such a way that these massive uh, rate increases haven't impacted them. Um, there, there are a lot of different scenarios, uh, but I think the most doomsday scenario, uh, uh, I think it was Alessio on Twitter, uh, Alessio Urban, great macro guy. He put the fractal of uh, when Lehman went under. In I saw this. I saw this. It was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so the S and P would have room to fall to eleven hundred if yeah. that was the case. So there are a number of different scenarios. You know, more, more, uh, you know, taking a stance of absolute doom and gloom versus okay, this is a relief rally spurred on by lower rates. Um, and as of right now, you know, basically we're just, uh, you know, myself and Nick and and what we do at the Bitcoin layer, we're just trying to weigh things probabilistically, right? So whatever the charts are telling us, uh, we we try to relay that information and sort of give all the probabilities. Uh, but you know. Those are those are sort of your scenarios, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm I'm a little suspect on the last one because I think back in 2008 when that all happened, I think they were still trying to wrap their head around like, what is this that's happening, and why is it so? Why is the liquidity and the credit in the system seizing up like this? Right now, I think they're looking at it and they're well aware of it getting that bad. And I think as soon as they even get a hint of it kind of turning in, in such a direction, their response is 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 going to be there. But who knows? I'm 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 in the first scenario you described. I think this is a bounce. I think we're in a in a very bear market. When I look at the the ten and the two, and I'm seeing that we're we're almost hitting like all time lows in a negative. I think we're at like negative point three between the ten minus the two. Yeah, negative three seven. Negative three seven. I think negative point five is the deepest that we've seen back in two thousand and in nineteen eighty nine. Um, when you look at that and you look at the unemployment rates at those exact moments in time, unemployment has always been at its at its fever pitch low, um, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now. So, um, what comes next is typically from an unemployment standpoint. Uh, pretty disgusting uh, when this starts to reverse itself. And so for for that chart, because it's just been so accurate throughout time, um, it's a little hard for me to suggest that uh, or to think that we're going to be able to, there's obviously other factors, but I'm not buying it for a second. I'm just not. Uh, hopefully I'm wrong for all the people that are, that are in long uh, positions, but most definitely. Yeah. A lot of people, you mentioned unemployment, a lot of people have been, and, and even the Fed does this, they take a look at things that are still looking good, but they're lagging indicators like unemployment. Um, and then, you know, the Fed will use that. Ah, oh, well, you know, we're still at 3.6% yeah. unemployment. And they'll use that to job on the market as if it's a good thing, but that, that thing's lagging. Um, so you know, lagging. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, like I, I'm sure Jerome Powell can can afford a Bloomberg terminal. Just take a look at you know all the jobs data that's coming out, all these other really important economic releases that are coming out. Um, you know things are uh, things are getting more dismal. Um, you know the the labor market's extremely tight, as you said. I, I the the last we we actually didn't get below three point six percent the last uh, percent unemployment the last hike cycle in two thousand and nineteen. Um, you know before that started to rise too, and then obviously COVID happened. So yeah, not looking ideal. Hey, so I want to put up a chart here. I really like this chart that you shared with me. For people listening, this is the S&P 500. And on the bottom, you have the three-month note. And what you're doing is you're showing how once they started tightening and you see the three-month coming up on the yield and selling off, um, you see a corresponding almost down to, what is this, a weekly chart, down to the week of when the S&P hit its peak and it started to begin its sell-off. So walk us through why you're choosing the three-month as kind of the indicator here and just some of your general thoughts on this chart. For sure. Yeah. Um, If anything, I think that the broad... The broad strokes for anybody watching is that rates lead the Fed and rates guide risk. Risk is, you know, forward looking, um, you know, six to 12 months. And and they see essentially uh, the reason I chose the three month was because, um, you know, of all the different um, maturities of all the different tenors across the United States treasuries, uh, the one that gets borrowed against the most, I'd say, or considered 
the proverbial risk-free rate would be the three months. Uh, you know, obviously, the the further you go out along the yield curve, uh, you know, the more duration, the more interest rate risk you incur. And so the reason I use the three month was because, um, you know, again, corporates borrow at the at a spread to this. Uh, and for that reason, I felt uh, and actually uh, Nick published this initially. So I'm taking a little bit of bit of his thunder. Um, essentially, this is what corporations borrow at. So, you know, naturally, you could extend that out and say that's what uh, things like the S&P would be uh, the most responsive to. And it's pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, the moment you saw the three month tick up. Uh, I think the WIC didn't even go as high as uh, 50 basis points. Uh, you saw the S&P begin a pretty substantial move down. And that just goes to show how dependent on on cheap, cheap, cheap debt we are. We talked about zombie companies earlier. And I think this is the easiest visualization for anybody uh, you know, to see how how over levered everybody is on this on this cheap debt, we've been able to binge on it, uh, you know, for the last fourteen years since the great financial crisis, but also uh, during COVID when the Fed decided to backstop literally everything, uh, you know, and and inject the economy with uh, with all of this liquidity, and now you're seeing okay, uh, once the music is up, the S and P has been brought down uh, a pretty substantial amount. Um, and and has only started to rally once rates have begun to level off in reverse. Uh, let's go to this next one, which is basically the exact same chart, only you now have Bitcoin at the top. And you know when we were kind of trading notes before we started, you had a, a statement that Bitcoin has been kind of a leading indicator to market moves. And I think a lot of people in finance would agree with this. And in in here you're you're kind of demoing that where the price started selling off on Bitcoin well before the three month uh, started to also sell off. What do you think's causing that? Why do you think Bitcoin would would lead the market on recoveries and 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 whatnot? For sure. So Bitcoin leads you know other traditional risk assets for a couple of reasons um but i'll also preface it with bitcoin is uh it, it also acts as a as a false alarm sometimes uh you know bitcoin has these extremely volatile swings and sometimes and in this case uh when bitcoin started to decline eight weeks before the three month uh started it increasing uh in this case it wasn't a false alarm but uh if you look back even just on this chart back to uh back to last may uh, you know, if you looked at that and then thought that broader risk was going to puke too, you were wrong. If you looked at that and thought, oh, rates must be increasing relatively soon, you were wrong. Um, but by that same token, Bitcoin does get it right sometimes. And, and the reason I feel, uh, and and we're going to publish uh, a longer form piece on this, we're going to do a longer form uh, SPY versus Bitcoin, SP500 versus Bitcoin study, uh, is because of Bitcoin's very, very tiny liquidity profile compared to the S&P 500. Um, Bitcoin, that's that's reason number one. So Bitcoin's market cap is $450 billion roughly, and the S&P 500 is right around $35 trillion. And so, you know, Bitcoin being a fraction of a fraction of the S&P 500, uh, but also trading with very high beta uh, to uh, other risk assets, it means that, as Luke Groman puts it, Bitcoin can be sort of a fire alarm. Uh, you know, when you're looking for something that could be a leading indicator on the direction of risk, um, Bitcoin, in this case, it led the S and P 500 by eight weeks. Um, you know, the the other thing is sort of this extreme excess of uh, leverage. So obviously, we had this massive leverage unwind. Uh, you know, sparked by the collapse of, of Terra Luna, um, and then all these insolvencies that we talked about, five billion some odd dollars of sell pressure, uh, and uh, you know, I guess it's just a symptom of of a free market, a market where there aren't a tremendous amount of regulations in terms of uh, leverage on the balance sheet, but also leverage, uh, you know, with these with these various uh, uh, exotic financial products um, that people can take on, and as a result of that, um, when leverage gets purged, the the price tanks uh, pretty expeditiously compared to other risk assets. Uh, but that said. You know, while Bitcoin can sometimes be unreliable, it led the 2017 S&P 500 top by something like two months. It led the 2018 top by something like six months, um, and then in 2021, the one that we just showed, uh, it led it by you know eight full weeks. So, um, you know, obviously, as Bitcoin monetizes and its market capitalization comes closer to that of the S&P 500, it'll be a less effective fire alarm. Uh, but as of right now, you know, it's a it's a moderately reliable indicator for when things are going south in traditional markets. Hey, we talked about the the ten year minus the two year. I talked with uh, Alf 
uh, last week a little bit about this. Um, your chart here that you shared with me, when you're looking at the largest disparity from a negative spread standpoint for the 10 minus the two year um, on these previous periods, um, going back to the 2000, right, basically right as 2007 started, you didn't really hit a recession until one year later, which is your red lines here on the Bloomberg chart. Um, then let's go back and look at the year 2000. It was about six months later, you, you were officially in a recession. And then in the 1989, when it, it was at the peak negative 0.5, it took nearly a year and a quarter to a year and a half before you had officially hit. And I'm, I'm completely disregarding COVID there in 2020 um, because I, I just kind of think that that was maybe a little bit of a different scenario of just uh, an unprecedented type event. But this looks like um, so, so similar to what we were seeing there. And you, you had mentioned earlier about how this is a much better leading indicator to a recession. Are there other leading indicators that you would pay attention to beyond the, the 10 year minus the two year? There are, yeah. Um, the 10 year, two year, just to provide some context as well. Um, I mentioned how twos trade with policy rate expectations, tens trade with forward growth and inflation expectations. And so the way, because this chart's been thrown around a whole lot, the way that this can be interpreted from 30,000 feet is below the red line when these curves invert is when growth expectations, forward growth expectations, you know, annual inflation, the Fed targets at 2%, are below uh, the policy rate expectations, right? So in other words, the price of money, right? Policy rate uh, is higher than expected growth, which is very bad, which is why sort of this, this twos 10 spread uh, is, is such a good indicator. Um, but looking at the rate of change there, that's that's not good. Uh, a, a couple of other things uh, I tend to look at, Nick tends to look at, um, are the five-year, five-year inflation swap, um, you know, not necessarily oh, yeah. as, a, as a recession barometer, but um, how forward uh, growth expectations are looking. Um, as of right now, things are channeling relatively steadily. Uh, we know that the Fed actually looks at the five-year, five-year inflation swap um, for some perspective as to you know whether or not uh, you know inflation expectations, and this means inflation expectations uh, six to ten years from now um, are coming down. They're increasing, and that's sort of what they use to dictate their 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 policy rate. It did start moving down steadily, but you know it's it's continuously channeling around that two five level. So we'll see. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we tend to look at is is the three month uh, ten year uh, Treasury spread, and that as opposed to twos tens because the Fed likes to wait until the very 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 last minute. Um, they like to look at the three month ten year spread for when oops we've gone too far time to reverse course. Uh, you know ultimately the Fed they could be a lot more ahead of the curve if they looked out uh, further on the yield curve and addressed uh, issues with monetary policy when the the longer tenors on the curve started to invert right you know when when fives tens begins to invert or, or even you know tens thirties like. Nobody takes a look at 10s, 30s. Nobody takes a look at 10s, 20s, especially not the Fed. Uh, but if they did, maybe they'd be able to adjust monetary policy ahead of some of these major major cataclysmic events happening. Instead, what they monitor um, is the three-month tenure, which is perhaps the, the the shortest inversion and the most severe inversion you could possibly measure. Uh, I don't know why we pay these people. I really don't. <laughs> I, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about like just the way they're reacting, I think so much of it is they just can't deal with a, a negative yield curve from a, from a management of uh, banking balance sheets, like all of these banking balance sheets uh, for them to have quote unquote assets in a fractional reserve system. It's, it's all based on the duration arbitrage that they have on their balance sheet. So as soon as the yield curve starts flipping that way, like they have got to, they've got to act because it'll get messy real fast. And I, unfortunately, I think that that's kind of what's brewing right now is in, in short order, but uh, we'll see. All right, uh, Joe, these charts are phenomenal. This is, this is amazing. There was one final one that I want to talk to you about. This is much more uh, Bitcoin related. You have a confluence indicator that, that you and Nick have worked on. Let me bring it up here for folks so they can kind of look at it. Talk us through what this is. 
Of course. So the first chart here is our fair valuation framework. And basically, this is something Nick and I uh, worked up uh, a month or two ago when we were trying to figure out the, the clearest and, and highest signal way in order to value Bitcoin. Oftentimes, people will get way too muddled when it comes to whatever indicator they're using. They, they lean too heavily into on-chain or they lean too heavily into technical analysis. And ultimately, it, it ends up, you know, your, your chart ends up looking like a, a five-year-old's finger painting uh, more than, you know, Know, an actual financial analysis a chart that you can derive signal from. And so uh, basically the idea behind this was that simplicity, 30,000 foot view will give us the highest signal. And, and really the way we went about this was going across three completely separate financial disciplines uh, in order to find the floor in, in every single one of them. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, we went through on-chain, right? On-chain analysis. Uh, we went through traditional technical analysis, and then we went through energy. Um, and the three metrics we derived in order to uh, create this floor um, are realized price, 200-week moving average, and actually proprietary metric uh, that I created called the electricity hash value. Uh, this was based on Charles Edwards' Bitcoin production cost. Uh, and basically, the way that that gets derived is uh, multiplying terahashes per Bitcoin by uh, it's it's I'm losing it, but essentially it's the production cost of one Bitcoin. And basically, the idea is that if you if you zoom out, even I have this chart up to 2019 because I think it's helpful to just take a look at the most recent uh, cycle or couple of years. But if you zoom out, you can see every single one of these floors moving in a stepwise function underneath the Bitcoin price. Uh, and this is very helpful because uh, when Bitcoin approaches uh, or falls beneath these floors, you can identify, okay, Bitcoin is, is cheap. Bitcoin is closer to its fair value. Uh, and when the spread between these widens, uh, you can say, okay, Bitcoin is overvalued, right? And and the reason we kept it at only three metrics uh, was because, again, you know, we feel that you could derive the most signal uh, you know, if you eliminate all of the unnecessary things. And so I just toggled to the next chart here where you combined those three, the realized price, the 200 weekly moving average and the electrical hash value into a single um, confluence price. And people can kind of look at that. I'd be really curious to see, I'm, I'm assuming it looks really good if you continue to zoom out. Oh yeah, it does. Um, not not to toot our horns at all. I mean, this people have so many people have come before in terms of this, uh, in terms of doing similar charts to this. I know I'm certainly not the first person who has used the word confluence uh, to 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 create a chart that describes a floor. Uh, but um, again, you know, the fair value framework. For taking that uh, idea of simplifying it even further, uh, we we made a re we literally just a simple average. Add all three up, divided by three. Uh, and it provides uh, a whole lot of signal uh, as to whether Bitcoin is over or undervalued. One of the cool things is that we also put an oscillator underneath so you could see whether Bitcoin was expensive or cheap. And we publish this every week uh, on our Substack um, for free every Saturday. We do sort of a weekly update. And this is one of our, our top of the line charts. We have you know a whole monitor that we go through. Uh, we talk about sort of Bitcoin's correlations, its prices. Uh, and this is one of the charts that we include uh, because I think really anybody who, who takes a look at this can understand, okay, what does this mean? In the top left corner, it says exactly the inputs, uh, the, the value of all of those inputs. Uh, and then at the bottom, um, you know, I put expensive and cheap underneath that uh, that line to, to show when the, uh, the the spot price of Bitcoin falls below the floor. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a really simple, I feel high signal way of, uh, of, of determining whether or not Bitcoin is over or undervalued. Let's say let's say that the doomsday scenario in macro plays out here in the coming two quarters. How do you feel about a model like this holding up, considering the the period that Bitcoin has existed relative to not really experiencing a 2008, 2009 like scenario? Some might argue that COVID you saw, but I think they came with such a fire hose of fiat printing in such a short, quick response kind of way that a Bitcoin had a massive sell-off, but it it rebounded within literally days. Uh, back to levels that it was before, I think it re recovered within 60 days of, of where it was at. So for people that might read this and be like, oh, well, it's below the, the, the price, but not necessarily having appreciation for the macro setup that we're in, and they're really not being a historical precedence. How do you think through that? And what would you say to a person like that, that might be looking at this chart and getting excited? Right. Absolutely. So 
you really have to look at all of it through, you know, what, what we try to do at the Bitcoin layer is look at Bitcoin through a macro lens, look at it through the lens of what rates are telling us uh, and, and sort of the geopolitical landscape and, and how things are playing out. Because if you take a look at this chart, it doesn't paint the full picture. You have to consider what credit conditions are like, what rates are telling us about how expensive money is at, at a certain point in time, uh, what the Fed is telling us about how it's going to guide monetary policy. So so looking at any, any one chart, especially a chart like that, uh, doesn't paint a, a full picture. Um, in, in 2020, I would say uh, we definitely didn't see a, a sustained recession. As you said, you tend to discount when the curve inverted in 2020. Um, I do as well. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't a sustained recession, as you said, uh, the, the Fed backstopped with liquidity almost immediately. You know, they created uh, several, several new institutions uh, in order to do so. And chances are they, they will in the next one. Um, but as of right now, the Fed is being extremely hawkish with uh, sucking liquidity out of the economy. And their tenor, apart from a couple of minute things, it hasn't changed much. And so the question has to be asked, like, how is Bitcoin going to perform in what might be like its first sustained uh, recession or major economic contraction? However, they decide to change up the definitions. Um, and, and I would say that the the best thing you could do there in order to you know try and figure out how Bitcoin is going to perform um, is taking a look at these historical levels, um, uh, you know, sort of combining that with uh, the the adoption trend of Bitcoin. Um, you know, how many new people are coming onto the network, uh, and 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 more so than anything else, understanding that Bitcoin sort of leads uh, leads other risk assets in this regard. I think Bitcoin stands to continue channeling around this level um, for a pretty you know, sustained period of time, unless we we see a pause in in rate hikes, which which very likely you know it, there's a scenario in which that could happen. Um, then Bitcoin could you know begin an uptrend, but as of right now, you know I I wouldn't expect Bitcoin to uh, massively break up or massively break down. We saw that there was a huge buying cohort around the twenty thousand level. So really, anything can happen. Um, you know, the Fed has again they're they're hawkish and that you know they're they're not ending their uh, their liquidity draining from the economy anytime soon. Um, and Bitcoin actually trades basically one to one with global money supply. I didn't include the chart here, but two weeks ago. Uh, Bloomberg has a very, very nice uh, indicator that basically compiles every single reported country's M2 money stock. Um, and just like other risk assets, Bitcoin rises and falls and rises and falls. And so as of right now, the year over year change for liquidity, uh, global liquidity, it's the lowest it's ever been. It's the lowest it's ever been um, in the last uh, you know three or four decades. You take a look at the rate of change for the policy rate. It's the highest it's been in several decades. And so you have to wonder, how much longer can the Fed keep up with draining liquidity from the economy? And you know the, the answer, in my purview, is not very long before bankrupting not just corporations but emerging markets, other uh, you know other very fragile entities. Um, and when they eventually reverse course, right? That's when Bitcoin stands to benefit um, because of Bitcoin's extremely low liquidity profile. Really, any major player stepping in which would undoubtedly happen if the Fed were to pivot, uh, would send Bitcoin flying. So as of right now, cautious, uh, you know, until the, the Fed sort of changes its tone. Uh, but, you know, that's that's where we stand. I just can't even imagine the consolidation of like the hands that are buying these prices for this long uh, through this. And, and like you said, if it continues to go sideways in, in the low 20s, um, and, and if, even if it dips back below 20 again, that person that those people that are buying and gobbling up all those sellers coins like i just cannot imagine what that's going to entail when you eventually do have a fed pivot and it seems to me like they're going to have to come with whatever this thing is that's brewing they're going to have to come with a a fire hose of liquidity that we have not even remotely seen historically is what i suspect and i I'm assuming you see it the same way, but absolutely, yeah. I, you know, new and creative <laughs> ways of of pumping the economy with liquidity is is the Fed's third mandate. So, <laughs> I like that. What a pleasure talking to you, Joe. Your your charts and just your analysis and ability to kind of communicate is just phenomenal. Really enjoyed this. Please give people a handoff. Your Twitter feed is amazing. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. But give people a handoff to anything else you want to highlight. 
Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Preston. Uh, you could find me on Twitter at Joe Consorti. And I'd also redirect listeners to my Bitcoin and macro Substack publication. I do it with uh, Nick Batia, author of Layered Money. Uh, it is at the bitcoinlayer.substack.com. It's a premium Bitcoin and macro newsletter. And we also have a free post that go up quite frequently. Uh, you know, in terms of high signal, that's basically where everything's going. So uh, I'd point people to the bitcoinlayer.substack.com. Fantastic. Joe, thanks for making time and coming on the show and uh, looking forward to chatting with you more in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Preston. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 